Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, I, I'm supposed to be here because there's being a photograph, so I can't wander around just to let you know. But as you was told by Lisa, uh, I had an educational background. I'm not a professional historian. I don't profess to be. I'm an amateur, but I, I'm an avid reader of history. But I love history, so I'm not going to tell you that I am something I'm not. But I do love history, and as was mentioned, I play golf. I was a golfer. I'm not a great golfer either, but I don't profess to be a great golfer. But I do play the captains. In every hole of the captain's golf course, Captain Payne, Captain Parker, Captain Crosby, and so on. And I said to the pro one day, about five years ago, I said, where's the book? What book? He said, there's no book? You're kidding me. It has to be a book. No, there is no book. So I said, well, that's my first project, okay? So that was written. I didn't sell the book. I did make copies and, and gave it away. So my local town, the library, and a few libraries have that book. It's called Meet the Captains of the Captain's Golf Class. And as I began doing the research on that, it kind of hit me that every time it says, you know, where are the sea captains have? And then, you know, another town say, we are the sea captains. And, uh, no, our town has the most to offer in terms of sea. So it's a kind of like a repetitious theme you hear in many of the towns. So the more I read about it, the more I'm saying, well, let me look into it. Let me see if there is a definitive. Um, and I, I would say, in my opinion, there are a couple of towns that maybe have a few more people than others. But one of the reasons I did this book is every town has a contribution to make. So there is a lot of connection. Every one of the 15 towns has something connected to the sea. And so I'm going to go over that with you in a little bit. Okay. So I have my first correction of the day. Paul is, is a historian back there. Okay, he was he was written a few books on local local history. I, I got this from the internet, so blame the internet. It's C A T O, Coke de Chesson. Okay, which Paul and me would be the land. Is that correct? Land of the Sound by the Bay. So what is it? By the South Sea. Land by the South South Sea. Okay, so that's that's what one of the things that Osceola was known for. No, now it froze. Okay, <laughs> it was too long. Okay. My talk today is going to be in three different parts. First part, I'm just going to talk generically about Cape Cod maritime history in general. Second part, a little bit, I wish I had more, but a little bit about Osterville. I don't know that much, but I know a little, little bit. And then I'll talk a little bit about that. each town's connection to the sea. You're going to get all three, all three variations. So the more I read, the more I figured out that there are there are time periods that correspond to sea captains. And what they what basically I found out. The type of ship and what they carried, where they carried it, what they did with the, the cargo was all related to the time period. So pre-revolutionary America, you know, before we were a country, when you think about it, what did we need to do? Well, we needed imports. We needed things to come in, right? Um, our biggest trade, of course, was in England. You know, the imports on tea and spices and clothing and everything. In fact, that's kind of what led to the Revolutionary War. Well, they had these different taxes. You know, I had to pay a tax on tea, I had to pay a tax on clothing, a tax on, on goods and so on. And England said, you have to trade with us. So that was such one version of the, of the, of the, of the uh, situation. And then the war actually began. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll show you some examples of ships that were used in the Revolutionary War, in the War of 1812, which went on to 1815. And then, uh, the, then between 1820 to 1850, that's just my own phraseology, but it's called the Great Age of Sail. If you're, if, you're, if you're thinking about, you know, most people do when they think about sea captains, they think about these majestic, tall ships, the three masts, you know, many sails and many rigs and so on and so forth. That's kind of what I envisioned, too. Um, so that was a great sail. After that, once you got past 1850, then you have the railroads coming in, you had metal being developed, but so changed a little bit. The kind of ship they would do was different. Uh, the amount of money needed to do the ships was, was quite different. Where the, where the ships went to became quite different. And then you have the age of 1851, where we got really involved with mercantilism, entrepreneurialism, the South kind of grew in textiles and in slavery, and then cotton fields and you know, all, all the rest. In the last period of this century, the light century, I call the Gilded Age. So, and then you know, people wanted to go to Europe. People wanted to, and there was no airplanes back then. So they took these luxury lines. Right? So, so you can see how the periods kind of, kind of correspond to what the ships were and where, where they went and what they did. But I thought there was an interesting connection. One thing I found out too, back in 1820, in the great age of sale, there are only two places you can really get money. These things were very expensive to do. You know, I'm talking the big, the big three-man ships, you know. You had, 
There were only really two banks, the Bank of New York and State Street Bank, which was the Boston Bank. Those are the only two banks where people can get money. So what would happen, 10, 15 families would kind of decide, we will sponsor you, they'll go to the bank and get a loan, and they would, you know, they would buy the cargo and provide them with a new ship, possibly a new ship or an older ship, and tell them where to go, make a plan of what, what kind of product they would use, where they would go. It became quite complex, but the, the banks had an integral part about where they would go. There were a few captains who were rebels, but most of them kind of followed the traditional, give me the money and I'll do the job for you, type, type situation. All right, let's begin with the very beginning people. I think there's a misapprehension, a misconception that indigenous people, native people did not fish. It's not true. They fished a great deal. The women basically went along the shore. They, and sometimes even boats too. Sometimes the women would be on the shore. They would do the local fish and just right not near the harbor. They would go out. Um, a lot of times it would just be the coal hogs and mussels and clams and things of that nature. In addition, the Wampanoa had an annual tradition. Once or twice a year, they would go out and capture a big whale. And the way they did that, they had a lot of little dugout canoes like you see here. They would have like eight, nine, 10, sometimes bigger dugouts. They would surround the whale, they would harpoon it or stab it in some way connected, and then drag it all the way back to Cape Cod for, for consumption. Um, every single inch of that whale is used, every inch. So the blubber is coming in for food, oil you know, for the lamps, because uh, not the indigenous people, but later on. Um, the teeth, you know, the, 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 the small part of the whale's brain that was used for, for cosmetics. Uh, the baleen was used like for the teeth and combs. Um, there was the oil that was you know, induced for perfume. Um, even the entrails of the, of the whale were used for perfume, believe it or not. So every single inch of that poor whale was cut up, sliced, diced, stored, and it had some, some financial benefit to it. As, as you know, the indigenous people were out of Cape Cod, the Wampanoas. So in this particular area, Mattachusi was probably the most prevalent name that you would probably know of. But, you know, you had Mother Moynix in, in you know, down, down Chatham. You had Gnostics over at Minic. I live in Brewster. So we had the, we had the Sakatasa would be another group. The Misha would be over by Provincetown. One thing I learned, too, which was interesting, the indigenous people were very matriarchal. So the women ran the ship. The women decided a lot of things. It was only the women who were allowed to vote, not the men. So when they had time for a new election, the women were kind of, they would coalesce. A lot of times, it wasn't half, but a lot of times, they would pick a woman to be their, their chief for their, their satrum, for that region, for that group. The other thing I learned too was that the woman had to decide who you can marry. So if a young male wanted to marry, Another not, young lady in the area and locally, they would say, Mom, may I? And she would do some research. She'd find out well, what's the benefit? Who are they? Who are they? What are they connected with? Sound familiar? So we do all of this kind of, kind of thing, and they would kind of look, do a lot of study, and say yes or no. So I, I found that kind of an interesting sideline. So the ships, as you can tell, the ships on this, probably the very early ships, they had a lot of different ships. The very first ship on the left hand side. It's spelled S-N-O-W, but back then they pronounced it snoo. So Captain Joseph Snow would ride a snoo. And then you had brigs and brigantines and clippers and there were different variations of the ships. Um, the two-mass ships were a little bit smaller than the three-mass ships. Obviously, the list was not quite mm -hmm. as big, um, but that was very prevalent to what they had to use. And it was for local shipping for the most part. They would go to you know, the south, the south possibly, or maybe towards Boston, do something to get wood possibly. Um, one of the things which was interesting, there in between like 1780 to 1719, 1820, almost all the trees in Cape Cod were burnt down, all the trees. They used that for the for the whaling. They needed to get to get, you know, heat to get the the try, they call it a try, T R Y. Try is where you burn burn the blubber for the whale. Every town had a try. So like when the Indians did it, I don't know how they did, did it exactly, but when the uh, when the Europeans came and they started to do whaling after the Revolutionary War, they would bring their, their harvest there, their whales, into the town, you know, Chatham, uh, I don't know about, yeah, Bruce, I think everyone, every single one, some are small and some are big. South Shore were more prevalent by the here, the here, you more like to have bigger tribes. Their tribes stations were kind of like a farm, if you will, for burning rubber for cutting up and dissecting the whale. So it was, it was really pretty much done, done everywhere. 
And then during the war period, you see the ships got to be a little bit more ornate. The ship on the right-hand side, the galleon ship, those are an old, old European ships. But when I look at the Johnny Depp movie, you know, the pirate ships, that's the kind of thing I, I envision, right, the galleon ship. And the reason why that was very popular with the pirates, first of all, they're older ships, they're less expensive, they're available in Europe, a lot of them, Ireland, England, France. And they have a, a greater hull. You can see how much cargo they can carry. They can carry a lot more material supplies than other ships. So that was a very prevalent thing. The other thing, which again, misconceptions for me, uh, we had privateers, you know, back then, before we were a country, you know, who would be allowed to go out and get supplies or have any kind of endeavor? Well, we didn't have a Navy, not yet, not, not an official Navy. Um, there were five ships that originally were uh, given money to by the federal government, our governor, our initial and if you want to call it a government, it's pre-government, right? And the beginning part, they would sponsor the ships to be built. And there was, some of them were built right nearby. Some of them built, um, one was in Dennis, one was, um, and one was in Kingston. There was, there was a few of them were built right here. Um, also, I found interesting, too, on the bottom, you see the USS Ironsides, one of our first ships. Um, there was a cannoneer, a fellow by the name of Crosby, cannoneer Crosby. He was the head cannoneer and she drives down Thompson Road in Orleans, a well, nice little side street, beautiful home, nice home. You'll see a little sign that says Crosby House, not big at all, very small little capable house. He was the head cannoneer for all of World War, for the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, even when they did the Great Lakes, the Battle of Lake Erie and so on, and they fought the French Canadians in, in, in the French and Indian War. Uh, he was quite intricate and part of, integral part of doing all of that. John Paul Jones was given the credit for saving or for beginning our Navy. And he was very materialistic. One thing I found out about John Paul Jones was that he, after he did our Navy, he went to Russia, became the Russian Navy. And he went to Finland, started the Finnish Navy. So it wasn't so much uh, you know, a labor of, oh man, I shouldn't say, it. I don't know his, his, his intention. I shouldn't say it that way. I, I'll just say that he, was, he knew how to he could materialize, he knew how to make a money by training people to become military figures within the Senate. That's, I'll just leave it at that. I don't know anything about why he did or how he did it. So back then, in fact, during the great age of sale, we didn't have news. Well, I had some newspapers, Hooker's Class, little ones. Um, didn't get quite the circulation we have now. Didn't have TV, didn't have radio, but they had posters. So uh, the bottom poster was very common to go to like a, like a store or a common place or a marketplace or something, and these posters would be everywhere. That's how people knew ships were coming in, or what ships were coming in, when they were coming in, where they're going to. So here's just an example of a poster. Which of the waves carry a lot of people from, from Falmouth and from Chatham and from Barnstable to California? And that took a while. It took anywhere between 75 days would be considered a really good rate up to 120 days. They had to go all the way around the South America, around the Cape, all the, way, all the way up to South America. So it took a long, long time. I read somewhere, too, that the uh, depending on what ship you're on, the, the fee, I think, was something like $25 one way. Didn't say anything about food, though. So if these guys wanted to do the gold rush, somehow they got their 25 bucks ready. One way, it's not going to guarantee to get back. Uh, well, how they ate, I have no idea. So I have to do some more research on how they hard tack or what some kind of product that they would, they would do along the way. And the word red jacket, one of the things too, which I found interesting too, most of the indigenous, most of the maritime figures had a great affinity towards the indigenous people. A lot of the ship names, the Atahualpa, even Red Jacket. Red Jacket was a, one of the native people. He was very proud. He was, a, he was an indigenous person. They wore a red jacket, kind of symbolizing that he took it from the British soldier and wore this jacket all the time. That's how they got the name Red Jacket to the ship. It was a ship that S.I. Eldridge would, would use. So it's interesting. They seem to have a very strong affinity between the maritime people and the uh, indigenous people. I'm going to talk more about Eldridge later, so I'm going to skip over him a little bit. The right, next period of time is like eight from the Civil War period. And now, of course, you know, the metal was common, much more common. It was, it was a product. So the ships became a lot bigger. So they had steamers and they had paddle boats going up and down the Mississippi. You had larger ships going over. Um, you know, steamships were big, so they mechanized the machinery. So it wasn't just reliance upon sail, 
Now they can actually, you know, power their boat. They can go to Europe and go further and go quicker and go, go faster. So it's already changing the, the nature of the maritime experience. The first, and an interesting side story too, we call it the Monitor and the Merrimack. Uh, originally, Merrimack was built on the northern part. It was built as a Merrimack up in the New Hampshire region. Up in, but then it was seized by the southern people. It was called the CSS Georgia. <laughs> So even though we still call it as the monitor of the Merrimack, it's really the monitor of the, in the Georgia. <laughs> they were the first battle of the two metal ships in the Civil War. But you can see how big the cargo ships were. Like even back then, those cargo ships got to be quite large and quite big, and they can carry oil, they can carry you know, much bigger products and do a greater number of things altogether. And then the last period of that century, I call the Gilded Age, with one famous captain, Alan Bragg, who was from my town, Brewster, he had a very, very large ship, the ship that you see on the left hand corner of the gray picture. He, um, he lost that ship, 1898, with a horrible storm. And believe it or not, he went all around the world a couple of times with his ship, but his ship sailed, uh, sunk within two miles of his house <laughs> off the coast of Bruce. The entire ship went down and he was, he was lost. When they say lost at sea, that's what they mean, lost at sea, literally. I mean, he was, he was, not, he was not sound. But you also get the idea of two columns. You'd say the ship, some of the, uh, you know, people now had a little bit, some people had some wherewithal, some capital. So they wanted to go to Europe. So one of the fellows named Collins, who lived in the Wall Street area, he began doing these bigger ships, luxury liners, and that became a forerunner of the Cunard line. He was for the Cunard, you know, the fast boats and extravagant boats. And, you know, even that the Titanic, which don't buy tickets for the Titanic. Don't, I don't recommend you do that. Um, but that's always in that period, I would say, close to that period anyway. There was a ship that said, but never sink. Guess what? All right, now a little bit about Osterville, just a little bit that I know. So Captain Jonathan Parker, um, it was one of, the, one of the more famous ones. He's a local fellow. Uh, one of the things I found out too, that you have one of the largest collections of wooden ships right here in this town. You have a great collection of wooden ships right here in Osterville. Um, he himself was a scooter trainer. He was called a coaster. So he would go down, you know, down the southern shore of Georgia and Florida and places like that bring stuff back and, you know, he'll do products back and forth. It's what's sometimes up north to the Canada's Canadian image. And that was a kind of a ship. The image, I don't have the actual ship, but it's an image of the type of screw he would, he would use. Osterville is also kind of known for, as I said, its collection and its great exhibit. Um, I have not yet been there. Is it, is it, I assume it's seasonal. I don't know. I don't know if it's open, open now. Um, Paul, do you know if it's open now, Paul? By the way, if, if anybody has a question along the way, um, raise a hand. I mean, I can wait till the end, but if you have a burning issue that you want to discuss or talk about, by all, by all means, let me know. So in Osterville, a lot of the ships were, were some actually were actually made there. So of course, you have the Armstrong Tilly Park right here in town, which is the largest private park in Cape Cod, not owned by a town, it's owned by people. Um, and the Crosby Boatyard, was right there. So a lot of, a lot of these smaller boats, they call that cat boat. You see, Winslow Homer is kind of famous. He did a lot of uh, pictures with young men, young boys, and in a little cat boat going out to sea. So that's one of the things that was typical, um, you know, typical thing to do. Question, yes, ma'am. Probably. Well, most of them, as I said, one thing I found out is there's a lot of interconnection. A lot of times, even the families, I would, if let's say 10 families got together and gave money. I was going to say, we want you to marry this daughter or that daughter or we'll buy his product or her product. So I wouldn't say always, but a lot of times the same last name was connected, but not, not always. But I, I'd say, I'd be surprised if they weren't, pretty much. And that's JFK, of course, had a birth, birth plate here. Um, he called the Riano Senior. He had a boat name that was made for him right here in the local town. When you think about Cape Cod in general, um, there's three parts Three, four parts, but the canal, we won't count the canal as a part. But, you know, over on the east side, you have East Dam and Chatham and those towns right on the ocean. Um, what did the ocean do? They tried to avoid the ocean. The ocean kind of brought driftwood and ships would cross and, and cry. A lot of um, shipwrecks would occur along the, along the shore shoreline. Uh, you see a lot of that. Um, and not a lot of whales and boats would be, would, would be caught, would be, you know, breaching, to be breach a whale, breach a ship. Um, and back then, a lot of towns, each town had their own rule, too. So, for example, in East Town, if a boat sunk or a boat crashed on a shore or, or, or got them, certain people were allowed privileges to go and just seek and take territory. 
I mean, it's like considered good, not bad luck, but good luck in a way. Good luck for the local people. If they got down there quick enough. Um, but depending on what the town, sometimes you could do it, sometimes you couldn't. It depends where you were. But the owner was kind of out of, out of luck at that point in time. Once the, the boat really breached up and broke in part, it was kind of open open game, so to speak. So and along the southern shore, you know, I would say that most of the biggest harbors would be Salmas, Barnesville Harvest. Locally here, you didn't have big harbors here, you had small harbors in this neck of the woods. But you had, you know, some boats, as I say, the catfish and some other boats made here, and, and they benefited from them. On the southern, like where I am in Brewster and North Dennis and those towns, those ships basically went to Boston, maybe maybe Canada. Was, those were kind of the they didn't launch from the ocean there typically, although some did. Barnes will have a car, but they kind of go around the Cape. But I say most of the time, one of the biggest ones is Falmouth. Falmouth had a company called the Guano Company, a Falmouth Guano Company. You familiar with what Guano is? Do you want to know what it is? <laughs> it's excrement of a bat. You say, why would you? Why would that be of interest? Why would people want to do that? Well, the farms in Cape Cod are not particularly soil dense or rich, so they would need that for, for, for farming. So they would. One of the things they would do, the Falmouth people, they would send ships down off the coast of Colombia and diff different islands along the way, and they actually actually seized, in some cases, seized islands, just took control of an island and built like a refinery. And they would take make these, these farms where they could take the guano and bring it back back to. Cape Cod, if, if whatever they needed. And Barnstable is kind of the natural, two natural harvests. So now what I'm getting into now is town by town. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about each town and why I think it's, it's very similar to my point. I'm not saying this is this historically <laughs> the, uh, the research, but it's just my, my personal belief. Um, why it's kind of important, what the connection is to the sea. So I'd say, you know, on the north side, we have a lot of boats, Barnstable Harbor, you know, if you've ever been to the Maddox Easter restaurant, you've seen the, you know, the boats that leave out of there, a lot of fishing, a lot of pleasure boats, a lot of small boats, and also big boats as well. The south part is where you got the, you know, the high highness, the ferries to the vineyard and to the, to the Cape and so on. So there are two really big natural harbors that people, people, people would do. I know there's a lot of tour guides here, so tour guides can probably tell me a few things about, about the tour boats, much more than I probably know. So one of the captains who was not too far away was Captain William Sturgis. And of course, the charter school, you've heard of Captain Sturgis Charter School, which is considered one of the better schools in America, by the way. It's kind of ranked in the top five or ten. Um, he, was in the, he was involved in all kinds of endeavors of the maritime history. He did fur trade. He did high trade. Um, like the, you know, cattle became big in California. People wanted to buy boots and vests and products and things made out of that. Um, he also had a ship called at Atahualpa, again, another indigenous person named from the Incan Empire. He did the China trade. He did the gold rush trade. So you see a picture here of the, of the clipper ship to California with the name of the ship California. Um, people would go to California to see if they can get a, make, make a living. They would see if they could kind of make, make something making happen to them. Um, probably 95% never made it big. A few did. Uh, in, the, in the coal rush, but the ones that made it big, made it very big. So, Bourne's an interesting town. Bourne is you know, the first town you come into when you come, come into the Cape. It tucks it across with the very first trading post. So the indigenous people had a small thing on the Malamette River, and the Pilgrim Puritans um, would do trade with them. They wanted to do trade. They were both ways. So they had things to sell, and the things they wanted to get back and forth. There's a replica of it now in Bourne. If you go to see it, it's not the real one, but the replica of what that trade post looks like down in Bourne if you want to see that. I also find it interesting, too, they have the Academy, the Massachusetts Mass Maritime Academy. At one time, when I was a young fellow, I had applied to um, Kings Point, Merchant Marine Academy. And that year, as soon as I had two appointments, I couldn't get my senator. He says, you're my second choice, but not my first. So I didn't quite get into the Merchant Marine Academy, but who knows? I could have... Well, I wouldn't have been a school person. I would have been maybe a maritime person. Who knows? Who knows what? What? what. But one thing which is interesting, I looked at colleges. And believe it or not, if you go to a mass maritime college, they do very, very well financially. So a first year alumnus from the Maritime Academy, male or female, doesn't make a difference. Sometimes they make 150, sometimes 200,000, first job, second job. Um, they do very, very well. They're, they actually make more money than Harvard and Yale and some of the other ones just because of the difficulty of where they where they work and so on. I found that of interest. One 
other fellow came from Bourne was this kid, Peter Storms. Peter Storms was an interesting sea captain. He was an aide to Simon Bolivar, you've heard that name. He was kind of like the George Washington of the South. So he, he liberated Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, parts of Colombia. They were under the rule of the Spanish you know, uh, people who came over. Um, but they needed to get supplies. And one of the strengths that Peter Storms has was he knew how to run a blockade. He would figure out a way to get around, get eight, nine ships in the harbor. He figured out a way to get around. He was like an expert at, at blockade running. Very, very wealthy man. I, I read one time he went to a bank in Bourne near the end of his career and says, I want to make a deposit. And the woman said, okay. And then she, she looked at the head. <laughs> he said, I can't take that money. He said, why not? Because you have five times more than our bank is worth right now. We can't take that money. We can't, can't do that. Um, so obviously, he did pretty well. He owned a, a good amount of territory up in the board at one time. Brewster is my town. A couple things about Brewster you probably know, but theory of the book Cape Cod by Thoreau. He didn't like Brewster. He says, too cosmopolitan, too ostentatious, too rich, too, too affluent, too. So all these people live in Brewster. Oh, so there are so, too many sea captains. Have. At that point, there were 99 sea captains' homes in Brewster. One of the things I couldn't figure out, I'd still try to find out, maybe, maybe I will one day. In his book, he called the Brewster the sea captain's town, which is, you know, it's curious to me. Why would he put it in quotes? Like, is that in a book somewhere? But again, I, I think with just common knowledge, I think I'd come to the realization for me, it's not in a book, at least I don't believe it is, but it could be corrected. But I think it's just like people said, that's the town. You know, again, that's kind of one of my guiding principles, why I, why I wanted to write this particular book. Um, the jetties, I have a lot of jetties, like this like an example of a jetty. One of the things they would do is sometimes they would hollow out like the left side or the right side of a jetty. And the reason they would do that, because Brewster doesn't have any natural ports. So if a kind of a clipper ship or it's kind of a smaller ship came in, they would wait till you know, high tide to bring it in that area. And then of course when the uh, you know the low low tide came, people go in the jetty, it was kind of easier to walk, you know, with, with just to, to load cargo and to get things in. And then when the high tide came in again, they would just they would leave. Oh, that's one reason. The one reason they have the jetty. But if you look at the cemetery, it's a great place to walk, the Brewster Cemetery. There's many of the sea captain's uh, burial grounds, and it says right there, anytime it says died in West Africa or died in Africa, chances are pretty good, not always, that they were involved with the slave trade. Because many of the slaves, you know, Crosby, you know, how I could take a name of you. That might be my next book. I'm thinking. I'm not sure. I'm thinking about that. Cape Cod Redemption of the Slave Trade. That becomes an interesting book. Sensitive books are right. A lot of times they're very sensitive about, you know, calling their relative my grandson. He's not a slaver, you know. You know I'm not sure. Let's, let's see what the evidence presents. I don't, I'm not going to say yes or no, and he was or wasn't. So they broke. In 1802, you know, Harwich and Brewster one time were one big town. But they had two churches. And one of the reasons why they broke off from, from Harwich is they didn't want to, they, you know, Brewster considered themselves again. So that's our own theory, a uh, more, little more affluent. They said, we have the money. Now, we're not going to support your town. You know, where is our town? So they had two separate churches that they, they had used. One of the sea captains from Brewster, Isaac Clark, um, he was just about ready to retire. One of the things that happened during the War of 1815, a lot of the British ships would come up along the coast, both in Falmouth and Brewster and a few towns, Orleans, and they aimed their cannons at either the salt mine or the tri work, or the town hall, or somewhere. And they would say, we have to pay a ransom. You know, if you pay us so much money, we'll just sail away. If you don't pay the ransom, we'll blow up your tri work, or blow up your, your town hall. So one of the things he did, he contributed money. He, two other captains from Brewster, contributed to this ransom, and they paid it. But as a result, near his end of his life, when it came time to retire, he didn't have too much money. So Crosby said to him, would you do me a favor? He said, would you do one final trip? So sure enough, he did one final trip. He went to the West Africa trip, and the book, the, the boat became contaminated, fumigated, was diseased, a very, very diseased boat. He died in West Africa. He was buried in West Africa. His wife was very angry at Captain Crosby, at uh, Captain uh, uh, Case. So it was very, very a cop, Captain Cobb. So he, he, but it's, by then it was too late. But then it was too late. Chatham is a very pretty town, too. They're all pretty. This town is just, I love this town right here. It's gorgeous. Um, 
One of the things that's kind of known for is moon cusper. You know, we all know what a moon cusper is. So a moon cusper is somebody who deliberately, one way or another, will tempt a big ship to come near the shore. But why would they do that? Because once the ship came near to the shore, they could drown, you know, especially in Malamoy, especially in certain areas. Malamoy particularly had a lot of bars, sands, very tricky to navigate. They didn't have good maps back then. So it would be stuck. Once they, once they got stuck, they kind of free reign. They can kind of grab hold of cargo and, and grab everything. But sometimes, like, when it was too bright, they didn't like that. Sometimes they cussed the moon. They, they cursed it out, right? They didn't want the moon to shine. Sometimes they put bright lights up. And, like it was a lighthouse, and they kind of pulled the ships. And that's why they got the name Moon Cusser. Um, that's why they put, that's why it really began the idea to have a lighthouse. Chatham was really one of the first lighthouses. There were two, the Highland Light was first. This one was the second lighthouse. Um, because the you know, ships would come way too close. And the governor, the federal government said, we need to protect our maritime people. So they put lighthouses along, along the edge so that people could see it. And each one had like a different radiation. So the Chatham Lighthouse had two distinct beams that would go off like they timed it so many seconds apart. So people knew, oh, that's Chatham. And one might have three, one might have longer lights. So each Chatham had like a little different signal. So captains would know kind of where they were in, in juxtaposition to the, to the shoreline. Um, there's a hill, even today it's called Wicked Hill in Chatham, and they say a lot of the moon castles will go there. So you've heard of um, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Battle of the 500. On which the ours is not the reason why ours is but to do and die, and into the battle of the yes, road to the 500. Well, he in his book, he, he in his book, poem talks about the moon cusp of the chapel. So it's kind of a, a well known situation. One of the captains from, from that town, Captain Crosby, he was a gold rush sponsor. He had given beautiful ships that he had to go. Civil War, he had a, a small ship called the Tuscarora, which fought against you know, the the Confederate ships, and near the end of his career, he became a school superintendent. I'm kind of envious. I mean, I was lucky enough to have been a school superintendent, two, two towns, but that's all. I was never a naval hero, never sailed a ship, never made a lot of money, you know, but it's, it's okay. I had a wonderful career. I'm not complaining. I'm just kind of being jealous probably more than anything else, but this guy, this guy did a lot more than I did. That is an, an example of a triword. It's not from Cape Cod, but it's kind of in the, the Jamaican Islands. That's what it would look like. A triword, every town in Cape, or many of them in Cape, they had these like belt shops and these workshops. So people would come bring their whale, cut them up, they would, they would process the meat, you know, and get everything well. If they paid a fee for that, of course, you paid whatever, whatever the ratio might be, one third of your profit or something, you paid a pretty good fee, but they would process the meat for, for you right there. And Dennis, too, Dennis had a big shipping building. Um, people don't think of Dennis or Cape Cod in general as being a good shipbuilding area, but there are, there are two of them in Dennis. One is called the Shiffrick, Shif which was on North Shore boatyard, and they made beautiful boats. They were kind of some of the best boats in the, in the country at that point in time. And Napscussed was another one, Napscussed boatyard. If you ever drive along 6A, the science is Corporation Beach, that would, that would be where the Napscussed Corporation shipbuilding company would be, would be at the very end of that road. That's where they made some of these boats in the, back in the day. One of the captains from Dennis was a captain, Henry Hall. As a very young man, he was in the Revolutionary War, he fought um, as a sailor, the Revolutionary War people. One of the things that he did was, you know, the old, these, these guys know how to survive. During the winter, the, what did they do? You know, or what could they do? He had a farm, many of them had farms. And he had a cranberry situation. So he, he began studying, and he was actually a pretty good economist. He learned how to irrigate. He learned how to put soils at different points, how to put different things on the cranberries and make it grow, make it grow more proficiently, more effectively. And he taught that skill to a lot of the sea captains. So many sea captains actually began growing crosberries, why, growing cranberries. That's why we have a lot of cranberries. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons. Um, the indigenous people use cranberries a lot. They call sukamesi, right? They sort of like one of their staple foods was a cran local cranberry. They have a way of making it even better. And a little beverage on the bottom is a Cape Codder. I do admit from time to time, I do have a Cape Codder. I do admit it. East Dam. East Dam, if you've, been, if you've not been to the East Dam National Park, by all means, I strongly recommend you go. Um, Captain Penniman House is still open and available. Captain Penniman is a famous whale, as you probably know. At one time, he was one of the richest men in America, among us. 10 richest men in the country. 
the uh, this variable is better, the equivalent of like, well, I want to say I think it's the exact number. It's like 17 years just on board. When the whales went out, they went out for a long period of time. Back then, the whales at that point in time were not back right off the coast. You had to pretty much go up to the Arctic, kind of go all the way around to the Arctic. Not only that, in Arctic, they all came, well, most of the whales came around the same time. Some of the ice broke, the whales started to come down south. So what would many of the whales do? They would spend the winter in their boat, and they would wait for the, arc, uh, the ice to break, and then they would you know, catch as many whales as they can and proceed to, to make some money. Now, when they did that, many of them had their wives with them. Many of the wives, I don't know what percentage, but a good number of them, it's a lot of bucks. Mentioned that they had their children, sometimes children too, but most of the wives. And these the wives had nothing to do in the winter. So they would have parties. They had like a music party, a card party, or a social party, or a gathering, have tea, you know, kind of thing. So it's kind of interesting how the social cliques with other click, you know, they had the sea captain doing one thing and the wives were doing something concurrent to that. Um, but if you get a chance to go through the house, I strongly recommend it. It's a good, a good tour to take. His wife, Bessie, um, was, she was a very independent woman. She could handle a ship. A lot of times she would leave the ship for a day or two and she would take charge of the ship. She ran the farm. Um, she ran town politics. She was none of the real, real go getters. She was a, kind of a known figure at East End at that point in time. You see an example, too, of the, the breach whale. I mean, back then, if a whale would, would, you know, would, would by somehow, some just kind of manage it, I'm sure, that it said different towns had different rules. Indigenous people could not touch a whale at any point with a kind of a hierarchy. So even though you were, you know, you were, you were you know, Wapanoa, and you, you lucky enough to get a, a whale right in your backyard, you couldn't do very much with it. Sea captain, the first choice, religious people had the next, depending on the town, had the next choice, but depending, depending where you really were. Harwich is one of the biggest ports. So Harwich is a lot of port, uh, relatively big port. In 1850, 71% of the males identify themselves as a mariner. So to show you how prevalent whaling or shipping would be back then. So a lot, a lot of people did that. Could be captains, could be, could be any, any type of thing. Um, you see the fellow there with a the hand out. His name was Jonathan Walker. There were a group of slaves who were off the coast of Florida with them on an island. And he heard about them, he heard that they were stranded. Um, he wanted to save them. So he sailed his boat to that island off the coast of Florida, picked the slaves up. He was going to ship them back to Boston. But back then, they had a law called the Fugitive Slave Act, which meant that you had no choice. They had to be returned to their owner and no one else. So they caught him in the act of being <laughs> breaking the law. They caught him basically with slaves on board. Um, so his punishment, they kept him for about a year and a half. They eventually had a trial. It took a long time to get the trial. As a punishment, they didn't put him in jail, but on his hand, they stamped S. S, slave saver, save the save the saver. Save. That's what they did. It's kind of brutal, but they stay, they deem that to be the important thing to do. <laughs> another one, uh, another captain I'll mention to you was the Chase family. It was a big harbor in Harwich built by the, the Chase family. Um, one of those sons, he had, he had eight sons, of which one of which um, Job Chase was a, the built the builder, the, the kind of maritime. He had the son, but one of his sons, Caleb Chase, he was a more the business guy. To go to Boston, they would go to Long Wharf in the Boston in the Long Wharf. Is, he, had, he and three other people sponsored that. They began at Long Wharf with, with their sold fish and products and, and all of that. He also began a coffee company, Chase and Sanborn Coffee and tea. So a lot of tea and coffee came as a result of the, the Chase Sanborn Company. Mashpee I found kind of interesting. Mashpee was the center, wasn't the only one, but it was the official center where the, you know, once, once the Europeans came, they said, we have these indigenous people, what shall we do with them? And they said, well, we'll give you some territory to, to reside. They basically gave them parts of Mashpee, most of Mashpee. Um, now, it wasn't just a goodness of their heart. I mean, they made them work, too. One of the things I found out by my reading, a lot of the indigenous people were indentured slaves or captured slaves in a way. And the way they would do it, so mom and dad would go to like a local store, buy a blanket or food or whatever they needed, some supply. And then they would copy how much they owe. And then after about two years or whatever the amount of time is, the amount of money, they would say, well, you got a choice now. Either you pay me the money right now, or we're going to take your son. And he has to work on our whaling ship. 
And sometimes you agreement for three years, usually much more, much. Once they got on the ship, chances were pretty good. They very rarely returned. So it was kind of how they had a captive audience, so to speak, of how they got how they got it to do it. This fellow, William Appus, he was himself a, a Wampanoag, and he wanted to protect against that. And he wrote some laws. He eventually died. He was had some part of the drinking. He died at a very young age of drinking. But he wrote a couple of books, one of them called The you know, Son of the Forest, which at the time was kind of an abolitionist anti-slavery uh, situation. Orleans, one of the people who always wonder, why did Orleans get a French name? Well, one of the reasons was a fellow by the name of Isaac Snow. So you see a picture of a prison right there. During the Revolutionary War, he was captured, brought to England. He was in the prison, the old mill prison right there. And then he was managed to get escape from there. He escaped to France. And he met two people in France who were of interest to him. He met, he met a fellow called Comte d'Estaing, with a title, and Maxi de Lafayette, who were both very rich, very sympathetic, very young people who believed in democracy. And they're very sympathetic to the American cause, saying, well, you should be free, you should be free. So uh, when East Ham, and East Ham was big, East Ham was wealthy, East Ham and, and a couple, couple of times, wealthy all together, when it separated, he came back and said, why don't we name this town Orleans, which is where the Countess Fung lived. But it was kind of a, a tribute to the French people being sympathetic to the, to the American people. Um, I also mentioned the Battle of Rock Harbor. We had a Revolutionary War um, battle fort right there in Rock Harbor. It wasn't a big one, but it was a small one. But was, nonetheless, the British left the ship for a little bit, and the Americans found a way to board the ship, take control of the product, took all their guns and all the supplies, took them off the ship, buried them in hidden places. <laughs> and the British were kind of uh, dumbfounded. How did you manage to do that? They found a way. Provincetown. Provincetown is a, you know, very, it was called Helltown back in, back in the day, uh, probably for a reason, probably. I'm not sure exactly why. It's called... You know, people would be, people wanted freedom there, just like everyone else. It was actually the first place where the Mayflower came. You probably know the story, but they came when the, when the, when the pilgrims came here. It was cold and wintry, and they went on board. They had a first encounter beach where they first met the Wapanoas. And they said, this is not a great place to land. I mean, the sand is not great. It's not, the, not a very wide area to begin with. You know, the Wolf Street is not very wide. Um, so they, they decided not to say, well, winter here. And then when spring comes, we're going to go to Plymouth. Oh, otherwise, this would have been you know, this would have been the original colony. Would have been, but they decided that it'd be better that way. Mayflower Compact was signed on board in Mayflower, so when it was stationed in the harbor, Pete Provincetown, um, I said, "There's no rules. I mean, there's no country, so we're going to make up a list of rules, very basic rules, saying if, if things can go right or wrong, here's what we're going to declare. Okay, how do how we're going to how we're going to rule each other? Um, so that's how the Mayflower Compact came into being. One thing too, I found interesting. The black whaling is probably the one profession where the black shipmaster could have freedom and could really, there was no, really no limit. So a fellow there, Epsilon in Boston, um, instead of my face, you should see his face there. <laughs> um, he, he became one of the richest captains in America. He became very, very wealthy. He was this, he had all black sea whaling ships, a lot of, a lot of black, but this whaling, not so much for commercial ventures, not so much for the you know, products and farm products, but for, for whaling, you know, they, there was really very limit. If you knew what you were doing and you got the money, you could really make a good profit. He eventually became one of the, um, in fact, his father had a Supreme Court case. His father was a slave working on a ship, a whaling ship, at uh, right after the Revolutionary War. And there was a court case saying, if you, were, if you were a slave and you worked on a slave ship, you had to give your money to the owner. You couldn't keep the money. So the court had a court case, and they said, that's not right. But they passed the law, but it wasn't, it wasn't really enforced. So even though it, theoretically it should have been enforced, but it really was not. One of the fellows who lives there was Baxter, Admiral McNullen. I've probably heard that name. He was a number, a couple of things. First of all, he was a, he was a real scientist. He was a, he was a Navy commander. He went to Bowdoin College. From, so he began a boat that he called the Bowden. It was the oldest sail in World War I, the oldest in World War I. He actually fought in World War II. So if he was the oldest in World War I, chances are pretty good. He was, might have been the oldest in World War II. I don't know that for a fact. He very well could have, could have been. Um, they named a pier. If you go to Macmillan Pier, right in the center of town, it's all called Mount Macmillan Pier, right in, right in the middle of town. That was in honor, in honor of him. Sandwich is an interesting place. I wouldn't say Sandwich was a founded 
in Glass who was founded by Glass. <laughs> so if you've been to the Sandwich Glass Museum, I would definitely recommend that as a, as a place to stop. Um, at one point in time, Deming Jarvis had a, uh, two large glass blowing factories, one near Boston and one in Sandwich. The Sandwich one became one of the biggest glass places in the world. Um, he imported people from Ireland and England. England, most, many of the English people are experts in blowing glass. The Irish was an industrial worker, they really did the grunt work. But at one time, more than half, probably 60 or 70 percent of the town was employed in making his glass. You can see how big the factories are. It's a big factory. Was there for 20 or 30 years. He had a ship called the Acorn. The Acorn was a ship. I'll tell you a little small story about the Acorn. It's kind of interesting. Um, when the railroad came in 18, late 50s, 18, 850, 59, 60, somewhere in there, um, they said, we'll, we'll, sh we'll ship your glass up to Boston, but we'll charge you a fee, of course. And he said, no, I don't want your fees. It was too high. So he said, I'll keep on doing it by, by ship. And so the, the company president of the railroad said, the acorn has not fallen from the tree. That will grow the wood. That will make the ship that you need to send your glass. So he built this big ship within a year and called it the acorn. So he's kind of a, you know, a flaunt to the, to the, the powers that be. That's the way, the way he did it. But it's a great museum. You can watch it. You can watch them do glass. He also began to mold product. You know, before that glass bowl, you literally had a blow glass you know, with your mouth and, or a product. He began a mold process. So you could take the hard, hard metal example, with a press, he kind of make glass much more efficiently, much more effectively. Um, they didn't use a sand. One of, some people got the wrong impression too, that the sand from Cape Cod is good for making glass. Not the case, it's very impure. Our, our sand here is not conducive for good glass. We got it from New York State up in the, up in the Singulate region and they brought it down here. There was much better sand there, uh, apparently, which is part of the chemical process, apparently. Truro. Truro is famous probably for more than anything, the life saving station. So along the way, you know, you had some um, these people, these called, they were called um, life saving. That's what they were called, life savers. Or and they're kind of the pre runner of the Coast Guard in a way. Because they would, they would, there was a night shift and a day shift. They, these guys worked long hours, 12 hours a day, all year. They had 12 months a year, they would work. Had minimal wages, sometimes five, eight, ten dollars per, per per week, if that. Um, how to survive on that? How to survive a family? Um, and they lived in a little station that would be there all the time. One of the fellows I talked about too was Edward Collins, Edward Knight Collins, who began that big ship. And they said that's when the metal came into being. You know, the metal ships. That's how the Cunard line. His family began. It was called dramatic shipping initially, and then eventually evolved into the the. the uh, into the actually part of the Titanic, part of part of the dramatic line too, as well. And the Kuna ship, that's an example of the Kuna ship um, right on the bottom there. Wellfleet, a couple of things I learned about Wellfleet, which surprised me. Um, there was a big fire. Wellfleet was going to be a much bigger producer of whaling ships and ships in general. But what happened, there was a tremendously big fire in 1850 that burned almost half the port down. But it grew, but not as big as, as people thought it would be, even though it was sponsored for a financial gain. Um, 200, 290 males worked as mariners out of 500, no, 600 people, almost half the town, um, just in well, just in, in, in wealthier alone. One of the fellows, if you look on the bottom picture, George Baker, Lorenzo Doe Baker. George Baker was the, for the father, his son, Lorenzo Doe Baker. He got a thing called the Boston Fruit Company. So as kind of a, he was he was doing you know shipping of general farm products. One day he said, well let me try some exotic stuff. He brought a banana, or some other kind of unusual fruits back with him. And then once he started doing that, it became a fabulous sensation. So he kind of that. But what they would do, they had plantations. They would take over an island, just like we did the, the Guano Company. Some of these sea captains took over a place and have a plantation. They would have indigenous people, their local people, working for minimal wages, producing the the product, and then they would harvest that fruit, and then bring it to, to America for, for profit off the coast of Colombia, a lot of these different islands in that, in that general region. One of the boats, the boat you see there is called a pinky boat. Pinky boats were a fishing boat. At one time, wealthy was called the mackerel capital of the world. I guess most of the mackerel fish, for some reason, is gravitated toward the wealthy. So they're, they're big on the kind of sex. And then you have Yarmouth. Yarmouth, of course, uh, it's a couple for a couple of things. Yarmouth, you, if you go to 6A, you'll see a lot of homes right in the middle of town there. 
been to the Story Museum, you know, the, 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 the cartoonist in different places in the middle of town there. You'll see a little plaque, it'll say Captain's Mile, and they have a name. Not much more than that. That just means it's a verified sea captain's house. And there are many of them, like 50 to 60, just in that one general area alone. They're going to do a second Captain's Mile on Unit 28 by the Best River Bridge. Right on the Best 28 by the Best River Bridges, they have another um, combination of homes, very similar. They're all going to be sadly maybe Captain's Mile Part 2. They're going to designate those as sea captain's houses. Many of them were beautiful areas to take a walk to. Um, Have you gone to the Baker, the Trudor Baker windmill along the south? It's kind of a nice little windmill. It was owned by five different sea captains. The first one who bought it was moved four times too. Every time they figured out, it's not the best place where they kept moving it, but now it's available in that, in that neck of the woods. And my last captain, my final captain, was John Sears from Yarmouth. So as I mentioned to you before, two things that every almost every Cape Cod town had a try, try work, the process to whale. They had um, cranberry, cranberry bogs of some type, and they had a salt work. So as you drive through the Cape, you'll see salt work laid, salt work this, salt work whatever. Um, there are many, many salt works on Cape Cod. During the Revolutionary War um, and you know, up to 1840, 50, there weren't that many, there were no refrigerators. So they needed to keep things safe. They needed salt for the product. So they provided salt for the, for the early colonies. Very important for them to do that. So originally it began like a very slow thing. You know, they would just like take the ocean water and then process it and let the sun you know, do its job and maybe process it a little bit. But John Sears is the one who kind of make it, make it more of an enterprise. He figured out a way we take a windmill and that supply some power, you know, generate some solar panel using glasses, almost like a solar panel, combined with a windmill. And that would make the salt become even more available or become much quicker. So he was called Sleepy John Sears because he was narco narcoleptic. He had a habit of actually falling asleep with his eyes open. So you could talk to him and you would never know if he's really there. John, hello, John, are you? I would never know. He, was, he might be sleeping. Um, not, not your husband, though. I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah. So, he, um, and then many towns did, and there are some beautiful software, you know, areas that people people know about all the other. So, Q&A.